today rolling. Today's service is brought to you by, <laughs> by David Engledis with a guest appearance from Millie. She's unimpressed because she wants to be fed, always. We hope you're fed too. Yeah. Welcome to our service at Barmer United Church. It's well, not. It's not really. It's uh, in our home since we are uh, in lockdown today and not allowed to get even across to the church. But Glennis and I have prepared this service, online service, um, even though it uh, seems possible that people might in fact be able to meet face to face on Sunday anyway. But do join us this Sunday, the 22nd of November is the last Sunday of the year, well, in the church calendar. And because it's the high point of the year before we start into Advent, it's the Sunday where we celebrate Christ the King. And you will see that uh, cropping up through the prayers and through the songs that we include in this service. A call to worship this morning, I invite you to join with me in the words in bold print on the screen. This day we celebrate the reign of Christ. Here we lay ourselves before him to rededicate our lives to the one who is the core of our existence. Let us worship the one in whom we live and breathe and have our being. Jesus Christ, whom we know as Living Word, Creator, Redeemer, and Bringer of Life, may we be immersed in your Spirit as we seek to honour you with our, with our praise, adoration, worship, and thanksgiving. Amen. Biggie? Yes, little one? 
Do you ever feel lonely? Yeah. Or scared? Or sad? Yes, yes. What's wrong, little one? What's worrying you? Well, well, in the icy, icy, ice, iso, isolation, it means we were needing to stay apart so the bugs don't spread. Well, in the icy, ice, I, I, iso, my friend had a birthday and couldn't even have a party. I miss playing with my friends. Well, little one, you could ring them up or draw a picture or... Oh, that's a good idea, but, but, Biggie... Yes, little one? Sometimes when it's not even... I, I see, I, I, I so, I feel lonely when some friends don't want to play with me. And sometimes I feel scared when there's thunder or I try to ride my scooter or... Do you know what, little one? You are never alone. Huh? Jesus said he would never leave us alone. But, 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 yes, Jesus died, came alive again and told his friends he would go back to his Father in heaven. But he said he would send the best friend ever, a strong, loving, helpful friend. Can we see that friend? Well, little one, we can't see, but we know that friend. We call that friend that Jesus sent the Spirit of God. The Spirit of God is with us. It's a bit like, I don't always see Grandma, but I know she loves me. It's a little bit like that. God is with us. God loves us. We are never alone. God sends us his spirit to befriend and help us. Spirit of our Father, Spirit friend. Spirit of our Jesus, Spirit friend. Spirit of God's people, Spirit friend. Let's come before God with our prayer of confession. Let's pray. Lord Jesus Christ, King of kings and Lord of lords, we, we are so ready to call you Lord, Lord, yet tardy to do the things you've called us to do. We confess that uh, we can get enthusiastic on Sunday morning and lose that enthusiasm for your kingdom through the week. Lord God, we pray for mercy afresh today that we might be zealous for you, worshipping, living for you every day of the week, 24-7. Forgive us that even though we know greater truth, we fail to obey your commandments. May your forgiveness lead us to transformation that your way may be our way. Amen. Hear these words of assurance. In Christ we find true forgiveness through confession and repentance. Eternal and abundant life is given. In the name of Christ I declare our sins are forgiven. Thanks be to God.
prayer of adoration and thanksgiving. O oh, loving God, we know you as creator, redeemer and sustainer. Receive our praise and thanksgiving for all that you are. By your living word, the cosmos was brought into being. By your living word, the law was given and community established. By your living word, the prophets called forth justice. By your living word, you became one of us and wrought salvation in love. By your living word, we encounter the leading of your spirit. By your living word, we have hope for every future. You, Jesus Christ, are the living word. O oh, glory be yours forever. Amen. Reading from Matthew, chapters 24 and 25, selected verses. Then if anyone tells you, look, here is the Messiah, or there he is, don't believe it. For false messiahs and false prophets will rise up and perform great signs and wonders, so as to deceive, if possible, even God's chosen ones. See, I've warned you about this ahead of time. So if someone tells you, look, the Messiah is out in the desert, don't bother to go and look. Or look, he's hiding here. Don't believe it. For as the lightning flashes in the east and shines to the west, so it will be when the Son of Man comes. Then at last, the sign that the Son of Man is coming will appear in the heavens, and there will be deep mourning among all the peoples of the earth, and they will see the Son of Man coming on the clouds of heaven with power and great glory. And he will send out his angels with mighty blast of a trumpet, and they will gather his chosen ones from all over the world, from the farthest ends of the earth and heaven. When the Son of Man comes in his glory and all the angels with him, then he will sit upon his glorious throne. All the nations will be gathered in his presence and he will separate the people as a shepherd separates the sheep from the goats. He will place the sheep at his right hand and the goats at his left. Then the king will say to those on his right, Come, you who are blessed by my Father, inherit the kingdom prepared for you from the creation of the world. In that reading, Gladys just read to us from Matthew. Jesus says that before he returns, false messiahs, false prophets will rise up and perform great signs and wonders so as to deceive, if possible, even God's chosen ones. He urges those listening, do not be deceived. How easily would we be deceived? Have any of you ever fallen for a scam email, clicked on an innocent-looking innocent link and got yourself into trouble, or responded to a scam phone call, uh, somebody telling you that you owe money, money to the Australian tax office, or oh, there's a problem with your internet connection and we can fix it for you. So many things that uh, just aren't quite how they seem. Take a look at this picture. What do you see? Some people say, yeah, no problem. Two people in profile facing each other. Others say, hang on, nah, that's a vase. Oh, maybe it's both those things. Or what about this picture? Those lines sloping up from the bottom right up to the top left, are they all parallel? Or do our eyes trick us into thinking that they're not because of those other short lines drawn along them? Or this one? 
Some people have a lot of trouble picking out the two possibilities for this photo. Some see what looks like a quite glamorous young woman, sort of side on, but looking away from us. Others look at it and say, no, oh, no, that's, that's an old, old hag, just looking slightly toward us with a pointy chin. Can you see both? Nothing at all tricky about this one. Clearly a frog. Except, what happens if you turn it anti-clockwise through 90 degrees? And it, hey, hang on, that's, that's a horse. Is it a frog? Or is it a horse? Or, hey, it's both. Are there three legs? Or just two? If you start from the right-hand side, you're pretty sure that no, it's just two legs to this shape. But when you get to the other side, hey, there's three. What's going on here? Some of these drawings are quite deliberately designed to, to trick us, to mislead us. Others are just ambiguous, so that different people see different things when they look at them. And it's a bit sobering to reflect that what we perceive might be open to question. We might have to admit that we've been fooled, or at least that what we were so confident about initially might not be the whole story. So how would we avoid being deceived by these false prophets that Jesus warned us about. More of that later. The heaven shall declare the glory of his name. shall see Reading from John chapter 9, selected verses. Then they took the man who'd been blind to the Pharisees, because it was on the Sabbath 
that Jesus had made the mud and healed him. The Pharisees asked the man all about it, so he told them, He put the mud over my eyes, and when I washed it away, I could see. Some of the Pharisees said, This man Jesus is not from God, for he's working on the Sabbath. Others said, But how could an ordinary sinner do such miraculous signs? So there was a deep division of opinion among them. So for the second time, they called in the man who'd been blind and told him, God should get the glory for this, because we know this man Jesus is a sinner. I don't know whether he's a sinner, the man replied, but I know this. I was blind and now I can see. But what did he do, they asked. How did he heal you? Look, the man exclaimed, I told you once, didn't you listen? Why do you want to hear it again? Do you want to become his disciples too? Then they cursed him and said, You are his disciple, but we are disciples of Moses. We know God spoke to Moses, but we don't even know where this man comes from. Why, that's very strange, the man replied. He healed my eyes, and yet you don't know where he comes from? We know that God doesn't listen to sinners, but he's ready to hear those who worship him and do his will. Ever since the world began, no one has been able to open the eyes of someone born blind. If this man were not from God, he couldn't have done it. You were born a total sinner, they answered. Are you trying to teach us? And they threw him out of the synagogue. And this is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Amen. As a child growing up, I had Christian parents who took me and my brothers and sisters along to a big city church where we went to Christian Endeavour, little kids, big kids. We went to Sunday school in the afternoon, maybe youth group uh, during the week, played tennis with the church tennis team on Saturdays. My whole life was surrounded by people who were convinced that Jesus was for real. And so uh, I had no trouble whatsoever agreeing that, yeah, that's, that's how I saw it too. So when I read the Gospels and I read about the deep divisions that there were amongst those who actually heard and saw what Jesus did, I find it a bit confronting. Now, wasn't it obvious who the goodies were, who the baddies were? Wasn't it obvious that Jesus was who he said he was, the Son of God, doing wonderful things? Uh, obviously, it wasn't anywhere near so clear-cut for those who were there at the time. From John chapter 7, we read, There was a lot of grumbling about him among the crowds. Some argued, he's a good man. But others said, ah, he's nothing but a fraud who deceives the people. But no one had the courage to speak favourably about him in public, for they were afraid of getting in trouble with the Jewish authorities. Hmm. Would we have dared to believe Jesus when the authorities were saying he was a, a con man? A bit later in John's Gospel, when the crowds heard him, some of them declared, surely this man is the prophet we've been expecting. Others said, he is the Messiah. But still others said, but he can't be. Will the Messiah come from Galilee? For the scriptures clearly state that the Messiah will be born of the royal line of David in Bethlehem. Some even wanted him arrested. The temple guards had been sent by the authorities to do just that and bring him in. When they returned empty-handed to the chief priests, they demanded... Why didn't you bring him in? Oh, we've never heard anyone speak like that, 
The guards responded, ah, Have you been led astray too? The Pharisees mocked. From chapter 9, we have the story of the man born blind and healed by Jesus when he made mud, put it on his eyes, told him to go wash at the pool of Siloam. Some of the Pharisees said, This man Jesus is not from God, for he's working on the Sabbath. Others said, But how, how could an ordinary sinner do such miraculous signs? So there was a deep division of opinion among them. In chapter 10 of John, we read, when he said these things, the people were again divided in their opinion about him. Some said, he's demon-possessed and out of his mind. He's crazy. Why listen to a man like that? Others said, this doesn't sound like a man possessed by a demon. Can a demon open the eyes of the blind? Further on in chapter 10, Jesus said, The Father and I are one. Once again, the people picked up stones to kill him. Jesus said, At my Father's direction, I have done many good works. For which one are you going to stone me? They replied, We are stoning you not for any good work, but for blasphemy. You, a mere man, claim to be God. So you get the picture pretty clearly that there was quite intense division of opinion from people who saw exactly the same things, heard exactly the same words from Jesus' mouth. For some, he's the Messiah, the long-awaited one. For others, he's crazy, he's demon-possessed, he breaks the law, he's not a good man at all. How would we have decided if we'd been there in that crowd. Would we have thought, well, the authorities say he's a con man, so he must be? Or would we have been convinced that Jesus really was a man sent from God? Or have they been fooled by a very clever, very persuasive, charismatic trickster? How would you have decided? The Gospel writers present five things they say persuaded them that Jesus really was who he said. First of all, they quoted the testimony of John the Baptist, who for those early Christians was a major figure, spoke with authority. He was clearly a great prophet sent from God, and many of them had been baptised by him. And John had said about Jesus, This man is the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. He's the one who will baptise you with the Holy Spirit. You couldn't easily ignore what John would say about Jesus. Then there was the testimony of God the Father, because when Jesus was baptised, came up out of the water, spirit seemed to come upon him like a dove, and that voice from heaven saying, This is the Son I love. I am well pleased with him. Then of course there were the, the deeds, the very the things that Jesus did. Healing, teaching, uh, curing the lame and the blind. And all of it done in a spirit of compassion and care and acceptance. Focusing not on making a big thing of himself, but focusing instead on reaching out to people that they might know the grace of God in their lives. And this would have been especially significant for someone like this blind man that we read of in John 9. Because he says, look, I don't know about all your religious arguments. I know this. Once I was blind, 
Now I can see. Then there's the testimony of the Old Testament prophets. The ones who had said, the one God is going to send will give sight to the blind. He'll heal the lame. He'll bring good news to the poor. He'll comfort the brokenhearted and proclaim that captives will be released and prisoners will be freed. He will tell those who mourn that the time of the Lord's favour has come. Pretty clearly, that matched what people saw Jesus doing day after day. And finally, those gospel writers were convinced when Jesus was raised from the dead on the third day after they'd seen him crucified on that cross. And of course, the question about who Jesus really is hasn't gone away. Every generation over the centuries and everyone who hears about Jesus today is confronted with the same question. Who really is Jesus? And how will we avoid being deceived by those in our day who boastfully claim to be the Messiah and gather many passionate followers? Jesus warned us, do not be deceived. And so we need to take quite seriously, how are we going to decide whether they're for real or fraudsters. Paul said something much the same uh, when he is writing to, in 2 Thessalonians. He says, Before Christ returns, there will appear a man who will come to do the work of Satan with counterfeit power and signs and miracles. He will exalt himself and defy everything that people call God and every object of worship. He will even sit in the temple of God, claiming that he himself is God. He will use every kind of evil deception to fool those on their way to destruction because they refuse to love and accept the truth that would save them. And in Revelation 13, that uh, challenging book at the end of the Bible with its Powerful imagery that I often struggle to make any sense of at all. But in chapter 13, John's very clear in his vision that he sees another beast come up out of the earth in the end times. He had two horns like those of a lamb, but he spoke with the voice of a dragon. He did astounding miracles, even making fire flash down to earth from the sky while everyone was watching. And with all the miracles he was allowed to perform on behalf of the first beast, he deceived all the people who belonged to this world. So it's quite a challenge. How, how would we avoid, how would we be able to resist being caught up with the crowds who would say, this is true, this is the Messiah come again. C.S. Lewis, who was an atheist for many years before he eventually acknowledged the claims of Christ to be Lord and King for his life, he wrote these words. I'm trying to prevent anyone saying the really foolish thing that people often say about Jesus. They say, I'm ready to accept Jesus as a great moral teacher, but I don't accept his claim to be God. says C.S. Lewis, that is the one thing we must not say. A man who was merely a man and said the sorts of things Jesus said would not be a great moral teacher. He would either be a lunatic, on the level with the man who says he is a poached egg, or else he would be the devil of hell. 
You must make your choice. Either this man was and is the Son of God, or else a madman or something worse. You can shut him up for a fool, you can spit at him and kill him as a demon, or you can fall at his feet and call him Lord and God. But let us not come with any patronising nonsense about his being a great human teacher. He has not left that open to us. He did not intend to. You need to make up your own mind. But for me, I'm convinced that Jesus was and is Lord and King, and I will worship him. Amen. You won't be able to bring your offering up to the front like you might on a traditional service, but you can either give it online, or deliver it round to uh, Jill Harris in their letterbox, or you can save it up for another Sunday when we meet face to face. But as we offer ourselves in God's service, let's pray. Receive the gifts we bring, we pray, Lord God, they are tokens of our love for you and our des desire to serve you alone. Amen. And our prayer for others. King of kings and Lord of all, you dwell among us to show us the fullness of your love and to bring wholeness and salvation for all. Hear us as we open our hearts in prayer this day. We pray for the salvation of our, of our world, that your created order might be restored, that every person might have clean, clear water to drink, food to eat, and freedom to fulfill your vision for their lives. We pray for those known to us who seek your blessing, a healing touch, a word of hope, light in the midst of despair, and empowerment to face the challenges of the day. And we pray for ourselves and your church. May we live lives that bring you honour. May our faith be strong and our service just and true. May we be always open to your will and your way. Amen. And as you go out into this day and this week, May you know the presence of Christ the King with you. Christ is God incarnate, the Lord of creation and gift of salvation. As we have been immersed in his spirit, so do we go from this place to serve in his name. May we serve without question through the love of God. May we live justly through the teaching of Jesus and the Word made flesh. May we exercise the gifts of the Holy Spirit to extend Christ's reign in every place. Amen.